Good morning, everybody. So good to see you this fine Sunday morning. It's beautiful outside. It's a very blustery day out there, but it is a nice, nice day for February. So glad for that. So glad that it's nice and bright and sunny and uh, just so glad that you're here with us. Glad that you're here with us as well on this uh, February day. So, uh, everybody have a good Valentine's? Everybody have a pretty good Valentine's Day? And yeah, we did too. We've had, we've had, a, had some fun, fun stuff going on. Uh, you all have a good uh, anniversary? I had to ask because Barbara's sitting up here and Ernie's sitting back there. I was just making sure. Just making sure. <laughs> oh, goodness. Yeah, Rose and I had a, a great anniversary, our 20th wedding anniversary this past week. Uh, yeah, I had a good time. We've had a good, good week, so praise the Lord. Um, any announcements this, this morning? Any announcements? Uh, the only announcements I have is um, this Wednesday, believe it or not, February 22nd, this coming Wednesday is Ash Wednesday, which signifies the first day of Lent, a time of preparation, 40 days uh, leading up till uh, Easter Day. And uh, I think I've already said a couple of times last Sunday and on Wednesday night's uh, broadcast that um, a lot of people have gotten in the tradition of giving up something for Lent. It's well, you're welcome to do that if that is, is something that maybe you feel strongly about, you feel led to do uh, over the course of Lent to help you stay focused on, on the season. But um, I would suggest and, and challenge us to do something more, whether it's more kindness, more service to our community, more service even here to our church or uh, you could think of a, a lot of good things that maybe we could do more of. Maybe we could write more letters to people. Maybe we could make more phone calls. Maybe we could stop and knock on more doors. So I encourage us over the 40 days of Lent and between now and then, think about what is God, what is he leading you to do more of? So uh, I would like for us to kind of take a little bit different approach to Lent this year. And also, I would also highly encourage you, I've done this the last three or four years on my Bible app that I have on my phone, is to do a devotional, to do a Lent, the uh, devotional for Lent. It's, it's always so good and encouraging, and, um, and I can help you find those in a, a Bible app called Version. I can help you with that. Or uh, there are also, if you Google Lent devotionals, you can find about a half a million of them, and you can <coughs> peruse those and find one that works for you and speaks to you. But uh, it is the time of year uh, that we can refocus ourselves. And uh, so with that being said, first day of Lent is Wednesday. Uh, Josh and I'll be doing uh, Wednesday night worship because on Wednesday night because it's the last Wednesday of the month. And we'll be kicking off our Lent, Lenten uh, devotionals with some worship music on Wednesday night at 6 o'clock. Love to have you join in for that. Also, March 3rd will be our second family fun night of the year. That's a Friday night. We had a great time uh, just a couple of weeks ago on Friday night for family fun night. Uh, we were able to, to watch a movie up here. A uh, great movie up here. The kids watched a movie and played and just had a ball downstairs. So it felt really good to be back here and doing that. So I encourage you to come and I encourage you to, to join in with that. There's plenty for kids to do. And guess what? There's, there's plenty for us grown-ups to do. We came up, the grown-ups came up and watched a movie up here and it was wonderful. We had a, such a good time. So March 3rd, put that on your calendar. No other announcements? Anything else this morning? All right, let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord Jesus, thank you, Father God, for bringing us. Thank you, God, for bringing us here today into your house. 
Lord Jesus, and your house is our house. And Father God, thank you so much for loving us so good. Lord Jesus, thank you for seeing the excitement, Father God, of the, the fires of revival burning uh, near us. And, and Lord Jesus, I just pray that, that that just burst all over the world, Father God. Lord Jesus, that what you started in uh, at Asbury University, Father God, and it has spread to several other campuses would come alive and that flame would burn in churches, small churches, big churches, homes, families, and in, even, even in us as individuals, <laughs> Father God, Lord Jesus, that that excitement, that, that surrender, that, that that anointing would just be everywhere, Father God. Lord Jesus, the, the world needs it. We need to wake up. The church has been too sleepy for too long, Father God. Lord Jesus, help us because people, we want people to go to heaven. Heaven is worth changing your life for. So Father God, Lord Jesus, just continue to help us, direct us, guide our paths, Lord. Right now, today, Lord Jesus, we come to worship you. We're going to lift our voices to you. We're going to lift your, our voices to you in prayer. We're going to lift our voices to you in song. We're going to lift our voices to you as we study your word, Father God. Lord Jesus, as we empty ourselves out with gratitude and thanks and worship for you, Father God. Lord Jesus, we pray that you'll refill us with you, with your spirit, with your grace, with your love, with your joy, with your peace. Thank you for forgiving us and loving us. Your precious and holy name we pray. Amen. Let's stand and sing. Let's worship.
Continue to keep Warren and his whole family in your prayers. Is uh, anytime you have such an alter life-altering process, um, take takes more than just the physical. It's, it's also mentally uh, and spiritually taxing. So continue to keep Warren in your prayers. Hey Marie. I pray for my grandma, friend Helen, who lost her husband last night. Yeah. Had a, a sudden death last night. Her, one of her grandmother's friends, husbands passed away unexpectedly last night. So they're they're all shook up today by that. So continue to keep them in your prayers, if you would. Add them to your prayer list. Ellen. Ellen. Ellen and her family. Bob. Um, Betty Robinson is out of the hospital and. Um, Slowly feeling better every day, I guess, the best she can. You know, she's staying with her daughter, Moni, Randy, Allen. And uh, if anyone would like to call her, text me, I'll send her number. She'd love to hear from you. Mm -hmm. She's eternally grateful for every prayer, every breath, every thought, every <laughs> movement she's making right now. Mm -hmm. And um, also, uh, you know, what I'm feeling from Aaron over there, I, uh, Chet and Kathy's had COVID. And, Think they're feeling better, getting in the right direction. Yeah, mm -hmm. we talked. We Rose texted her. They've been texting back and forth, and she felt better yesterday. But she didn't elaborate <laughs> on, on that. So probably still feeling icky and sluggish and yeah. all that fun, exciting. Hundred percent, but on the upswing. On the upswing, we'll take that. Yeah. We'll take that. So, Kathy, if you're watching, I see you are. I, I can actually read it from here, believe it or not. Uh, we're praying for you and Chet. God bless y'all. We miss you terrible when you're not here. Bob? So also, um, I'm not sure what's going on with Ashbury. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure. What's something going on. big. Something <laughs> big. We're calling it the Holy Spirit. Praise the Lord. Let's call it that because that's the biggest you can get. So, mm -hmm. but something big there. But I, I got to speak to a guy yesterday um, that uh, he told me a story is uh, on his birthday that I don't know what the date was right here soon. Um, they always go with a group of friends and they go out and they have a nice night. He was looking forward to that. And his wife suggested, "How about we go to Ashbury for your birthday?" And um, he says, to be quite honest, yeah, it's a great idea, but I, I wanted to go out with my butt. I had a great night, you know, and, and, uh, but they went, him and his wife, I don't know if any else went with them. And he said he was just totally amazed by the experience there. He, he said, I, he, he came to tears trying to, trying to explain it because his words weren't adequate, but he, he said, you could feel this 
Prince and down. And he said to hear the testimonies that were going on and, and different things that were going on in, in conversation from individuals, um, he said, um, you know, I, I said, it's, it's a convicting spirit going on there for, for everybody. And, uh, he said he was so moved by it that they went back three times that week to see if it was just the experience of being there or if it really was something uh, more. And he said each time was almost deeper than the last time. Mm -hmm. He said it wasn't just, I mean, you know, initially there was 15 people, I guess, that stayed after a worship service and then it went to God knows how many. Mm -hmm. and, uh, he told, I'll, I'll end with this one quick story, but he said, you know, people were giving testimony of how Things were kind of dots were kind of connecting for different things. But he was talking about this one lady. He said at one time you had to stay outside. The, the church was full. Mm -hmm. You couldn't go in unless there was a seat available. And they ushered you mm -hmm. in. You know, I got one seat, I got three seats, mm -hmm. you know. And he says the wait was sometimes over three hours long. And um, one lady finally got in one seat, you know, and she said, I have to go to the bathroom first, you know. And uh, then that was another 30 to 40 minutes mm -hmm. wait to get in there, but she went to the seat, you know, mm -hmm. she, she mm -hmm. went to the seat so she wouldn't lose it. And but, but the whole time she was there, she was trying to get a hold of someone that she knew there, but the internet was just fluey. Mm -hmm. And um, then when he ushered her to the seat, he sat her down right next to the girl she'd been trying to get a hold of. <laughs> <laughs> God is good. I just want to say praises and praises for Raspberry too because this is, you know, we've been praying for our kids for how long now and what they've been struggling with. And God has just opened up the floodgates there. Yep. And it's going to spread. I feel like it's just going to spread from there all over the state, all over the nation. And he's going to save our kids like he told us he would. Yep. If we'll let him. You know, the. Um, we got to let him. We're so guarded. Most of us don't remember that this very church denomination started with the very same kind of revival that mm -hmm. came run, came we're, read. Yeah, we're going to talk about that. Uh, many, many years ago. Uh -huh. And then in the 1970s, there was another uh, worldwide revival. Mm -hmm. And so God's not through with us. He's not yeah, through absolutely. with us, and he is still calling us to come to him. And, mm -hmm. and uh, we just, uh, I, I just pray that people's eyes will be opened and that that their hearts will just melt and just want to serve him. He's an awesome God, and he, he's not going to forget us. Yeah. Uh, but he does have a timeline. Yep, absolutely, which we're also going to talk about in a few minutes. Thank, thank you for prepping our, my sermon. Uh, yeah, so, um, yeah, I mean, what we don't sometimes see is God's doing this all the time. It, d d it doesn't ever stop. We may not notice it, you know, the way that we are noticing it now. I mean, Facebook, all the social media outlets are flooded with this thing. But there's been revival going on in the Philippines for about three or four years. Did you know that? You know, I mean, it's, it's just, it, he is always at work. He is always pouring himself out somewhere. You know, we know we need it in America because we've become so complacent. We've become so um, settled in our ways in a, in a lot of ways. But anyway, you know, that's, that's really between you and God. But, uh, but we'll talk about that again in a minute. But that, that is something, that, you know, we, we want to continue to pray about. We, we are, we've gotten so comfortable. And honestly, Christianity is not about comfort. It's about security, but it's not about comfort. So, anything else we need to pray about? Anyone else we need to pray for? I know there's a lot. There's always a lot. And maybe you're just not thinking about it right now. But Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord Jesus, we just praise you and thank you for that we're alive at this time, that we are getting to witness something special something spectacular, uh, uh, your outpouring. 
We can call it revival. We can call it all kinds of different things. But Father God, the truth is, it's just, it's just people are hungry. People are thirsty for you, whether they even know it or not, Father. So Lord Jesus, Father, I just pray that people all around the globe will just be caught up in your glory. Because that's what it is. You're glorious, Father God. Lord Jesus, help us, Lord, where we're guarded, where we put up walls, even between us and you. Father God, those barriers would be broken down where worship isn't just something we do. It's who we become. It's what we are. Lord Jesus, that even things like that we do, like communion, would just become a powerful move in us every single time. Lord Jesus, that every time we step foot in church, we come, we come ready for you to experience you in our lives. And Lord Jesus, every time we walk out the door, we're ready to experience you wherever we're at, whatever we're doing. And Father God, that we're prepared to share you in your glory, wherever we go and whoever we're with. Lord Jesus, I, I just thank you for answered prayer with Warren. Lord Jesus, I pray you continue to be with Kathy and Chet in proving them. Lord Jesus, I, I pray for uh, uh, the lady who lost her husband, Father God. Lord Jesus, just be with that family. Help them through their grief and their suffering as they, as they go through something that was unexpected, Father God. Lord Jesus, I just pray over this community. I pray over this county, this state, this country, this world. Father God, Lord Jesus, that we would get to see this growth, Father God, this beautiful anointing that you've leveled upon our state and our area. And Father God, Lord Jesus, help us be part of it. Father God, that we're awake. Lord Jesus, let us not go back to sleep. Father God, we just praise you and we thank you for everything. You're so good and we love you so, so much. We praise you and worship you. In your holy name we pray. Amen. We're going to sing uh, our communion song number 100 in your hymnals. And as we finish, if someone, a couple of people could come up uh, for communion and all.
Heavenly Father, we just thank you today that we're able to come here and join with each other. Uh, we lift up all the people on our prayers and concerns list and those who can't be with us. As we take and break the bread and drink the juice, let us remember uh, that you were broken and torn for us, that your blood poured out for us. And Father, just let us have a revival in our heart and in our church. Amen. Amen. those that are sick and heal them at this time please take a portion of this that you've blessed us with and use it for your word to extend your will amen So we started out right away during our prayer time talking about this revival uh, going on at Asbury University. Uh, in the 80s, my brother went to Asbury University. He attended and graduated from Asbury University and went on to graduate from the, the seminary with, with his uh, master's degree in divinity and uh, has gone on and he's he's preached and done that sort of thing and ministered uh, since then but uh, I was 14 years old when he went to school and so on the weekends a lot of times I went and hung out with his buddies uh, at their dormitory which was lovingly called the zoo 
and it lived up to its name. They were good boys. There was never anything bad going on that I ever saw, and of course, I was a young young man, and they they uh, kind of took me in, and we played basketball together, and we went swimming together, and they, they included me in everything, and uh, I was at Asbury a lot as a young person, and back then, um, uh, the Ichthus Music Festival took, took place right there uh, in Wilmore before it moved out to the farm that it's at now, but uh, there were a lot of amazing things that happened at Asbury College back then. That was before it became a university. And so when this started a few days ago, my childhood memories go back to pranks in the dormitory and and playing basketball and and uh, with the with the boys and I'll never forget one of the boys I can't remember what his name was Lord help me but I can't remember uh but we went to the basketball gym one day and he said watch this well he pulled this wooden ramp out from one of the back rooms and he showed me how you could run and jump and dunk the ball which was the only way I was going to be dunking the ball okay so we would run up that ramp and dunk the basketball and we had so much fun just he and I in that big gymnasium all by ourselves and I think my brother was in class and maybe I was on spring break and I spent the whole week there I think but so Asbury has a lot of great memories for me. Also, after my first marriage dissolved, and that was really, really hard on me, my wife divorced me after I told her I was going to be a pastor, and she said, well, I ain't going to be a pastor's wife, so she decided to take a different route. And fortunately, God kept me on that path, even though I... I made that path go a lot further than it should have, but he got me here to where I'm at today. But I attended a thing called the Walk to Emmaus at Asbury University, and it changed my life forever. And the Walk to Emmaus was one of my first experiences at the age of 26 where I felt what Bob's talking about that pressing down, and that pressing down leads to a kind of purification, just being filled with an overflowing, an unexplainable feeling of contact with God that a lot of people are experiencing in our state right now, today. And we've all heard the talk about that revival happening in Asbury University in Wilmore, right here in Kentucky, and several worldwide revivals have began right here in our state. You know, Pam referenced one here just a few moments ago. In June of 1800, the Red River Revival began in Logan County, a revival that essentially helped begin the Second Great Awakening. Also, about the same time, right in that same time in the early 1800s, there was the Cane Ridge Revival that, that she referred to that really the, the Christian Church Reformation started and kind of came out of that, also started right here, in Kentucky, it drew over 20, okay, now, to get 20,000 people in the same place in 1800 is not like today, okay? So over 20,000 people came to a small church near Lexington. In 1906, a revival broke out in Los Angeles with thousands and thousands of people gathering and worshiping God during the Azusa Street Revival. You remember that? Some of you remember that? With people of all kinds of races and all kinds of backgrounds falling out and surrender to God. In 1947 and 1948, there was the latter rain and the healing revival, which brought 
Bill Bright. Anybody heard that name before? Bill Bright came to those revivals and he began the camp Campus Crusade for Christ movement that still goes on today. Most of the last century was filled with Billy Graham crusades. Anybody ever go to a Billy Graham crusade? I did. I attended the one in Louisville. It was also a place where I felt that, that overwhelming movement of God. And his crusades resulted in tens of thousands of people being born again and receiving salvation through Jesus Christ. In the mid-90s, 1990s, maybe you remember this, God once again brought a series of revivals. In 1994, it was the Toronto Blessing. In 1995, ushered in the Melbourne Revival that was on uh, Florida's space coast, down on the east coast, east coast of Florida. It was a huge, huge revival, series of revivals, Modesto and the Brownsville, Brownsville Revival in Pensacola, Florida, which recorded over 100,000 conversions in two years. Right about the same time, 37, this may sound familiar, 37 college revivals swept across America. Right now, we're over 20. There's 20 universities like Asbury where this is going on. Of course, Asbury's were receiving most of the, most of the attention, but uh, in the mid-90s, 37 college revivals swept across America, and it began at Howard Payne University in Brownwood, Texas. Guys, you might remember the Promise Keepers revival. Remember that? It's by far the most publicized of the mid-90s revivals, and it saw over 5, 000, sorry, 5 million men attend their meetings in the mid-90s. And so it's been kind of quiet since then. Or so we or so it seems. But like I said a few minutes ago, God is always at work. This is always going on. It's always happening somewhere. Always God is on the move. I love that song. It was one of Maddie's favorite songs. God is on the move, on the move today. And it's true. It's never really stopped. So we're here today in Sulphur, Kentucky, 2023. And I'm really not going to talk much more today about the revival because this is the way I feel. I love it. I love it. I love seeing what's happening. And I hope, I hope that it is the start of something big. But the reason I, I w went through and gave you a little history lesson about revivals in Kentucky and what's happened in the last several centuries and decades is that it starts but it seems like the church goes back to sleep after a while. We go back to our safety nets of our local churches. We go back to our comfy places where we don't feel stretched, maybe. Where we don't feel as challenged. Or we don't feel as caught up in excitement. Let's face it, some people don't want any excitement from church. They don't want any excitement from their faith. They want it to be comfortable and they want it to be secure and they want to just sit back and say, I'm safe, so I'm okay. I'm done. It's the truth. I know people don't necessarily want to hear all the truth, but I feel like the day that I gave my life to Jesus and I surrendered to him, that that's the day revival happened in my heart. And that flame's never gone out. I'm just as, I, I'm more excited about Jesus now than I was then. And even through challenging times, even through hard times, I've always felt that flame in me of loving Jesus. And I want to represent Jesus wherever I'm at and whatever I'm doing, whether I'm at work or the grocery store or the Walmart parking lot or here in Sulphur at our church. So 
the last thing I want to say about this today, and, and, and it's between you and God, in life we can choose to live in constant revival. Did you hear me? Amen. We can choose to live in constant revival revival through our salvation or we can choose to remain quiet slumbering embers so that leads me to our subject today over a month ago god put on my heart that we really really needed to talk and and already this year just since january we've talked about contentment we've talked about atonement the power of Jesus' atoning blood. And God, from the very beginning of this year, has really, really urged me to talk. Let's, let's talk about the serious things. We know Jesus loves us. We, we, we need to be reminded of the reality of our existence. So today we're going to talk, start talking about heaven and hell. Heaven and hell are real they're things we need to talk about. They're things we need to know about. So we're going to start Genesis 1-1. Listen to this. Genesis 1-1. You can turn there. You know it, but you can turn there with me if you like. Genesis 1-1. If you have your Bibles at home, if you don't, go grab them and join in with us. Maybe a pen, a pencil, and paper if you want to take notes. Uh, here, if you have your bullet, and I've left you some space there to to take notes if you want to jot down notes. Genesis 1.1, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface deep and the spirit of God was hovering over the waters. So he created everything right there. He determined when the beginning was, okay, of everything. Now, if you will, flip over to the New Testament right near the beginning of the New Testament to Matthew 25, 41. Matthew chapter 25, verse 41. And uh, you might, might recall, some of you who study your Bible, been going to church for a long time, Jesus is talking about sheep and goats. Right? He was talking to farmers. He was talking to just regular old people like us, farmers and local people and merchants, and that was his audience. And he was t talking about sheep and goats that God would separate mankind at the end of their lives, well, some to the left and some to the right. So th this is uh, during that conversation, uh, beginning with verse 41. Then he will say to those on his left, Depart from me, you who are cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. Then he will say to those on his left, Depart from me, you who are cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. Some harsh words. You might note that those words have red letters. You might want to take note of that because to me, the red letters adds a little explanation to it all and an exclamation point when it's being said. So for believers, Christians, who want to claim that there's no hell, that hell's not reality, I, I beg to differ. Because we see right here, Jesus himself tells us hell is real. Heaven and hell are real. You know, I don't, I don't have any doubt of that. I mean, if you open your eyes and look around at life, you should understand that heaven and hell are are real if heaven and hell are not real well listen to this think about this for a minute if heaven and hell are not real neither is christianity if there's no heaven if there's no hell then there's no 
Christianity, nor is church real or salvation isn't real if there's no heaven or hell. And really, if there's no heaven and hell, then there's no hope. There's no hope. There's no, there's no need for hope. There's no eternity if there's no heaven or hell or really anything else that we do as Christians. If there's no heaven or hell, then we're just a social group. That's just the truth of it all. So if all the rest is real, if we believe in all those other things, if we believe in that, then shouldn't we emphasize the reality of heaven and hell as places where we'll spend a lot more time existing than we do here on earth? Okay, so let me ask you. When you think of a long life, when you think of, oh boy, when you're talking about somebody maybe that's passed away, you think, well, they lived a, they lived a long life. What, what do you think? What do you think? What, what's your measure of a long life? 90 years? 90? Not very many make it to 100. But 100 years? You think 100 years? That's a long life. That's a long time to live. I don't know how old you are, but think. Okay, Maddie's eight years old. That's 92 more years to get to 100. That sounds like a long time, right? Sounds like a long, long time. Well, if heaven and hell are real as we claim, then that 90 to 100 years is just a drop in the bucket compared to the amount of time for your existence. If you believe in eternity, if you believe in heaven and hell, which we claim that we do. Jesus has already told us in Matthew 25, 41, that God has already prepared a place, right? Now, we like to think of, remember when Jesus told us that he will go before us and prepare a place for us. Like We like that part because he's talking about heaven. We love that statement that, that he says, oh, he's going to prepare a place for us. Well, listen to this. In Matthew 25, 41, God has already said he prepared a place for those who are cursed as well. A place of eternal fire. No thanks. I don't want any part of it. I don't want eternal fire. And we're going to get more into that in a minute. And, and you'll probably agree with me. You don't want any part of it. Hell is real. I don't want to go there. Right? Right? You feel that way too? You feel that way with me? Hell is not a place we want to experience. Some people think they are already living in hell here on earth. That is not true. I've had people look at me in the eye and tell me, I'm already living in hell, preacher. No, you're not. Your circumstances may be bad. Your situation may be bad. You may be really unhappy. You may be disappointed, but... Most of the time, our, our unhappiness, our seasons of feeling like we're in a living hell are short. They're circumstantial. Circumstances that typically change or you're, you're in a season. But let me tell you something. According to the Bible, life on earth is a cupcake compared to eternity in hell. You see, hell is a punishment. Depart from me, Jesus said. Depart from me. Go away. You've had, you've had plenty of chances. I'm even here with you, and you reject me. So I'm sorry, but depart from me. Revelation 21, verses 6 through 8 says this. He said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To him who is thirsty, I will give drink without cost from the spring of the water of life. He who overcomes will inherit all of this in heaven, and I will be their God, and they will be my people. Ooh, I like that part, don't you? Ooh, I want that. I want that, don't you? But, it says... But, listen to this, the cowardly, 
the unbelieving, the vile, the murderers, the sexually immoral, those who practice magical arts, the idolaters and all liars. Their place will be in the fiery lake of burning sulfur. Not sulfur, Kentucky, hopefully, right? But in a different spelling too. The cowardly. Who's the cowardly? Who do you think that might be? It's probably the people with the crosses hanging from the rearview mirrors and maybe they have the Jesus Save shirt or the bumper stickers, but, but they're too cowardly to live out their faith. Maybe they're not really saved. Maybe they're fake. Maybe they're false. The cowardly, too scared to love Jesus enough to claim him when times get tough. The cowardly, the unbelieving, the vile, the murders, the sexually immoral, those who practice magical arts, the idolaters and all liars, their place will be in the fiery lake of burning sulfur. One thing to take note of here is that cowards and liars are grouped in the same group as murderers and witches. Cowards and liars are grouped right in there with murderers and witches. We might not group those people in the same group, would we? Very likely, we would measure those kind of folks differently. But it, that apparently God thinks differently than we do, right? The thing they probably all have in common is unbelief. That they've not truly received salvation from Jesus so what's the Bible just, what did it just tell us? They're cursed. They're cursed. I don't want to be cursed by God. I want to be loved by God. But at some point, there is, there is a timetable, like Pam said. There's an expiration date. There is a time when you will have to be saved or you'll be cursed. It's just, it's just going to happen. <coughs> So what kind of place is hell? Well, hell is a place for Satan and fallen angels, beast of evil. The Bible is very implicitly talks about the beast in, in hell, different kinds of beast. In hell, there'll be false prophets. There'll be those who worship Satan, Wicked humans and anyone who rejects the gospel of Jesus Christ. There's only one way to heaven, people, and that's through salvation from Jesus. It's the only way. There is no other way. You can't convince me otherwise. So the Old Testament talks about hell in Psalms 49, and it says the wicked perish in death. you think dying would be enough, right? But no. The wicked perish in death. In Job 24, it says there will be judgment for the wicked. In Isaiah 66 and Daniel 12, it says there will be eternal punishment. And once again, punishment in this life tends to come in short circumstances or seasons. But hell multiplies punishment into eternity. Hell multiplies punishment into eternity. And I want to ask you, are you willing to test those waters? What if hell is real? Then are you willing to take that chance? Would you be willing to go there instead of a place with no more tears, no sorrow, no hurt, no pain, no loneliness, no want? We all need to make a choice. And, and honestly, we all have to make a choice. Because the Bible also says, does it not? And if we claim we believe the Bible, then we need to believe this, that every, every knee will bow. 
every tongue confess. Because don't you think when he says depart from me, don't you think people cry out to him? Please no. No, don't. Don't don't let it be too late. Please don't let it be too late. In the New Testament, hell is described as a place of separation from God in 2 Thessalonians. A separation from God forever. No more chances. Don't put God in that position, please. Hell is also a place of the second death. You ever heard that term before, second death? Well, let me explain that very simply. After your last heartbeat, after your last breath, and your body dies, that's the first death. But then, if you are eternally separated from God, that's your second death. No coming back. The second death is eternal distance from God. Hell is described as a place of condemnation torment, weeping and gnashing of teeth, the destruction of the body and soul, punishment, destruction, everlasting chains, eternal fire and blackest darkness. I want to read you this passage from the book of Jude to close today. It's Jude chapter 11, verse 13, woe to them, they have taken the way of Cain. Those who are familiar with your Bible know exactly what that means. Woe to them, they have taken the way of Cain. They have rushed for profit into Balaam's area. They have been destroyed in Korah's rebellion. These people are blemishes at your feast eating with you without qualm, shepherds who only feed themselves. They are clouds without rain, blown along by the wind, autumn trees without fruit and uprooted, dead. They are like wild waves of the sea, foaming up their shame, wandering stars for whom blackest darkness has been reserved forever. Don't, don't tempt fate. Be sure. And I would love to live, I would love, love, love to live in a world that was excited about Jesus. Who was enthusiastic about their salvation. Not just Comfy and cozy. They're like wild waves of the sea, foaming up their shame, wandering stars. We all, everyone in this room, know somebody. We all know. We all know somebody that has rejected Jesus. Who are clouds without rain. What good are clouds without rain, right? Right? They're like autumn trees without fruit. You don't get too excited about walking up to an apple tree in the fall with no apples on it, right? Hell is real. So that's, that's the tough news for humanity, okay? That hell is real, and we talked about it here today. We learned about it here today. And I don't know about you, but what I learned is I want no part of it. I want no part of hell. I want the promises of heaven, which over the next few weeks we're going to learn about. And, and I did this on purpose. God did this on purpose. I shouldn't be so bold as to say that. God did this on purpose. We talked about hell today. But we're going to start out Lent talking about heaven. And it's exciting. It should be exciting. We should be ramped up talking about Jesus 
looking towards heaven. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord Jesus, I, I know it's real. I know. I know you're real. Father God, I know hell is real and heaven is real. And I know and I believe your Bible. I believe what you teach us. I've seen too much. I've experienced too much to not believe it. You're not too good to be true. You're too good not to not believe in. I love you, Lord. Father God, thank you, thank you, thank you. Lord Jesus, for all you've done for us. Thank you for saving us. Thank you for giving us salvation. Lord Jesus, help us, lead us, guide us. Father God, to get into the battle. Lord Jesus, there are people going to this place called hell and we might be able to help the, to direct them away from that to you. Lord Jesus, we need to, we need to get at it. Something's got to change. Father God, too many sleepy people in the church. Help us, Lord Jesus. It's not about guilt. It's about living an exciting, adventurous life with Jesus. Father God, Lord Jesus, I just praise you and thank you, Lord. Father God, if anybody watching this or listening to this, Father God, has not accepted you as their Lord and Savior, today needs to be the day that we get on our knees. We cry out to you, Father, forgive me for I have sinned. I want you, Lord Jesus. Come to me, and I will go with you. I'll follow you, Lord. Lord Jesus, release our hearts to the fullness of your truths. We worship you, praise you, and thank you. In your holy name we pray. Amen. We're going to close by singing number 334, and I want to reiterate one more time you don't feel your salvation today you either need to make your first time claim or you need to rededicate your life to our loving Lord and Jesus
from this place. But let us just be on fire and stay on fire for you, Lord Jesus. Father God, Lord Jesus, help us just to jump right into the pool with you, Father God. Lord Jesus, just protect us and help us and lead us. And the, the enemy is going to try to dull us again. To try to put us and lull us back to sleep, Father God. Don't help us to not let him do that. Help us, Lord Jesus, to keep our eyes on you. Lord Jesus, to keep our minds and our hearts full of your promises, Lord Jesus. So that we can live out a life that makes other people want you. Other people know they need you. Father God, Lord Jesus, thank you for this message. Thank you for this time. Thank you for everything in your precious, holy, amazing, wonderful, incredible, saving name we pray. Amen. 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 Have a great day. God bless. See you real soon.